Thanks, guys. Um, and Marianne, I haven't forgotten you. You will be doing the Bible reading. You're still prepared, prep for that? Just not yet. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we've just come back from 10 days away. And it's nice to have time away, isn't it? It's nice just to take a break from things. Um, I just found myself sitting here this morning and thinking about what I'm going to be talking on today. And almost... Just shut up, guys. I want to stand up and say something. <laughs> but it, it, it's good to sit and rest and sing and read the words, scripture. It's, it's like a pause. It's like that Sabbath we've talked about in the past. Important to have that Sabbath. Um, so now what I want you to do, I'm just going to give you a minute of just silence to clear your brains, to ask God just to clear away the things that are going to distract you this morning. Um, and just focus on his word. So let's just stop for a minute. Father, so many things running through our heads uh, from a busy week to a busy week to come. Uh, what am I going to make for lunch? Um, how long is Steve going to talk for? Uh, Father, these things tick over in our brains and distract us from actually listening to your voice. Father, I pray that you take these distractions away. Father, that just for 20 minutes or possibly 40 minutes... We sit here and we listen, wanting to hear you speak to us. Father, wanting you to say something to me personally. Not to hear a message and think that would be good for such and such to hear, but to listen to the message and think, now how does that affect me? Father, your word is true, your word is real, your word is your word. And if we can't stand on it, what can we stand on? So, Father, speak to us today. Help us to hear your voice, whether it be shouting or whether it be a quiet voice in the background. Make a difference in us. Create in us a clean heart that wants to hear from you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. I heard a quote during the week, or a, a, a thought during the week, um, which really struck me. And the thought is, if you had to give up everything in life, is it worth it to hear the voice of God? Now, it's easy to say, yeah, sure, that's what we always say. You know, I'm willing to give up everything. I'm willing to lay down my life for him. But if you had to give up every good thing in your life, and all you had left was just to be in the presence of God, is that enough for you? Is that enough for you? And it might be yes today, it might be no in 30 seconds time. Is it enough for you? As we can't, we're actually just confused matters a little bit. We are looking at Psalm 34, only to show you why I don't want to look at Psalm 34 this week. Okay? And then we're going to look at Psalm 34 next week. And we're going to look at Psalm 56 this week. So this is why I don't want to look at Psalm 34 this week. Psalm 34 starts off, and in my, in my NIV it says, and it's pre-verse 1, it says, of David, when he pretended to be insane before Imbimelech, who drove him away and he left. Now, in Hebrew Bibles, in Hebrew Scriptures, this is verse 1. Okay, it's not just a note that was added later on. It is part of the message. And so what it's telling me is, because I like to look at things in context, you need to read this in context. You need to read Psalm 34 in context. Because when I read Psalm 34 without putting it in context, I think, wow, this is a lovely psalm. This is very nice. Um, 
yeah, God, there's lots of good things in there I can take away from that. But as soon as you put it into context, I find this psalm hypocritical. Hypocritical, I can't read it and go, yeah, that's good, David. Thanks for sharing that with us. I'll hang on to those. I can't. And why is that? Because of the context. What is the context? The context is when David pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. David who? King David. Hey, can you remember the story of King David? He's a shepherd boy who is anointed to be king, but Saul is still king, and David won't step on Saul's toes. So we have Saul the anointed who becomes the unanointed, and now David the anointed who's not quite yet king. And he goes into the presence of... Well, he he hangs out with Saul at one stage. There's a battle going on between the Israelites and the Philistines. There's this guy there by the name of Goliath. Recall that dude? Big bloke. Makes a bit of an impact. And David hears of Goliath, a shepherd boy. And there's a famous, well, it's not a famous speech, but there's a speech that David gives. You, You remember those speeches, or do you recall speeches that actually take you back to places? Uh, For my kids, it might be, um, that'll do, pig, that'll do. Babe, of course, yeah. Stupid is, as stupid does. Can't remember the bloke's name. Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump, yeah, nice. To infinity and beyond. Buzz Lightyear. I'll I'll be back. Hasta la vista, baby. They may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. William Wallace. In the movie or in real life? I think it's just in the movie. Yeah. What about things like, I have a dream. Martin Luther. A statement, a speech that he gives that actually reflects the whole purpose of his life, doesn't it? What about never give in, never give in, never, 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 never? Winston Churchill. Yeah. So you hear these speeches which for for us, from movies, they take you back to a movie. But from people, they take you back to an ideal that the person has. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, as... David approaches Goliath. He has these words. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. Pretty gruesome, isn't it? But the next verse. All those who gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. That's how I remember David. A guy who was a man after God's own heart, who knew that God was bigger than any spear, any battle. He goes out there with a slingshot, a couple of stones in his pocket, to take out this giant. Hang on to that verse. as they come back from the battle after David has slain Goliath, there are chants going on in the city. What are the chants going on in the city? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. How do you reckon Saul reacts to that? Yeah, not so good, was it? Yeah, kill him. And then for the next few chapters we see exactly that. Saul's attempt to kill David. What's David's reaction? Really fast. To run. To hide. We have the story of uh, Michal, his wife, who lowers him down over the wall so that he can escape and sticks an idol in the bed so it looks like he's in the bed asleep. Uh, Tells a few lies about the fact that he's sick and he can't come to the feast. We have the the next chapter 20, which talks about David. uh, He's supposed to go and have dinner with King Saul. David knows that Saul's going to kill him 
And so he gets Jonathan, Saul's son, to lie on his behalf so he can escape, so he won't get killed. In chapter 21, David runs away to Nob. He, uh, he comes to this guy called Ahimelech, not Abimelech, Ahimelech, who's a priest and lies to the priest. The priest says, where's your men? He says, oh, they're over there waiting for me. David's got no men. He's running. He asks for some bread. And then he asks for the, a sword, for a, for a weapon to defend himself with and gets given the, the, the sword of Goliath. Massive thing. Like the sword of William Wallace there. It's a massive thing. And then runs, of all places, to Gath. Why is Gath important? Gath's Goliath's hometown. He's just killed their, their giant, their, their victor, He's just killed them, and now he's run to Gath. And the, the story is that he actually gets recognised by the Philistines who say, isn't this the king of, of Israel? He's not even really king yet, he's just anointed king. And David goes, oh, this is not good, why am I here? Uh, what am I going to do about it? And then acts like a madman to the point where the king of Gath says, why do I need any more of these madmen in my presence? Get rid of you. That's the story leading up to this psalm of 34. This psalm that says, He delivered me from all my fears. Verse 5, My face will never be covered in shame. What's it mean to act like a madman? To, to scratch at walls and have drool running down your beard and to make no sense. Verse 9, Those without him lack nothing. And then in verse 11, he has the gall to say, come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What, David? If this is a psalm written about what you've just been through, I don't want you to teach my kids about this stuff. Because he says in verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and lips from telling lies. But what's David just been doing? He's been lying and deceiving. Was it God who told him to do those things? I don't believe so. Was it because he feared God that he did such things? Well, then why would he ask for a weapon? Why does he take the sword of Goliath? This psalm irks me. And then he says in verse 15, to seek peace and pursue it. And in doing so, where does he go? To Gath, where he's got to be the prime target of the Philistines because he's killed Goliath. This psalm makes no sense. As I read the psalm, I go, David, yes, it sounds nice, but if I put this into context, you're a hypocrite. This makes no sense to me at all. It doesn't reflect that major speech that David made in front of Goliath. You don't need a sword. You don't need a spear. God will be your defender. And yet what's David doing? He's running and trying to find weapons to protect himself. Is that whole idea that God is so big a naive thought? Can God not protect me from all situations? Well, if you think that's true, have a read of in the same little passage we've just been looking at, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 18 to 30, 24, when Saul comes looking for David and Samuel's there. I'm not going to go into it. Have a read of it yourself. 1 Samuel chapter 19, 18 to 24. Can God defend us on our behalf? Or is that just naivety? Is, do I have to do something about it? This is Psalm 34 in context. But now, now I want you to read the context in context. And Mary Ann, I'm going to ask you to come and read Psalm 56 for us. I wonder if this irks you as much as it irks me. Yeah. Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise, 
In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? All day long they twist my words. They are always plotting to harm me. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, eager to take my life. On no account let them escape. In your anger, O oh God, bring down the nations. Record my lament. List my tears on the scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemy will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I'm under vows to you, O God. I will present my thank offering to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Psalm 56. Thank you, Marianne. So why have we chosen 56? Is it just like a, well, this is a good one that sort of wraps things up. I mean, 32 and 33, we just looked at the last couple of weeks. That would be very good explanations of what's going on in Psalm 34. But again, I've gone to Psalm 56 because Psalm 56 is in context. How does Psalm 56 begin? It's that little bit that's not verse 1, that prelude. For the director of music to the tune of a dove on distant oaks, I don't know that tune myself, of David, a, mit, a miktum, which is, sounds to be a musical term, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. When was David in Gath? Twice we have records of. Once, later on in the story, where he takes 600 men and his family and he takes them there and looking for protection amongst the Philistines. And in 1 Samuel chapter 19, 20, 21. 1 Samuel 21, this very story that we're talking about. So it seems that when David goes into Gath, for whatever reasons it possessed him to go to Gath, carrying the sword of Goliath, into Goliath's hometown, seeking refuge. It seems that he was arrested or put under house arrest at that point in time when the Philistines recognised him, which makes sense to me that the Philistines, here's the, the giant killer, we're not just going to let him roam the streets here, we're going to lock him up. And that's when he acts mad. So this is the context. This is the context of the context. This is like the psalm that fits in between the story and Psalm 34. And in this psalm, we get a bit of an eye-opener as to what's going on in David's life. I mean, the psalm begins, you notice straight off the bat, be merciful to me, God, men hotly pursue me. The situation hasn't changed, has it? The men are still after me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. The situation's the same. I'm under attack. But in verse 3, there's an echo, an echo ringing of Samuel chapter 17 when he faced Goliath. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid, because what can mortal man do to me? Verse 4, is, it seems to be a struggle. It goes back to, but all day long they twist my words and they're always plotting to harm me. They're conspiring and lurking and watching my every step, eager for a chance to take my life. Deal with them, God, in your anger. Bring down the nations. But in verse 8, but, but record my lament. Do you remember what Gary said, I think it was last week, where he was talking about when you, you experience the forgiveness of God, you need to remind yourself that you are forgiven, that your guilt has been taken away. And how's the best way to do that? To sing. 
to sing to because what's singing do? It's the same words over and over again that are embedding themselves into your mind. The songs that you remember from kids, from being child, children, from nursery rhymes, all the rest, that just go over and over and remind you of truth. And it is here that David picks up on that. He says, Father, my God, I, I don't like what's going on around me and I, I want to save myself. I do. I, I, I need that sort of Goliath. So I've got some way of defending myself. But God, I know you're bigger than all this. I know you're in control of this. And, and I've said the words that I don't need a sword or a spear to, to defeat my enemies. My God will do it for me. But they're all around me and they're attacking me. But God, I repent. I repent. Record my lament. That you are God. In comparison, I am nothing. I am nothing. Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? See that I am scared. See that I am afraid. But I thank you, God, that you're not leaving my fear in men around me. Because what has been David's problem all this time? He has been fearing death. He's been fearing what Saul can do to him. He's been fearing what his enemies will do to him. He goes into Gath and he fears what the Philistines might do to him. But then he recalls that I don't need to fear men Because what can mortal man do to me if God is my God? What can mortal man do to me? If I put my trust in you, then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. And by this, I will know that you are, that my God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I trust I will not be afraid. And then he repeats it again. What can man do to me? I'm under vows to you, God. And I'll present my thank offerings to you, even though you haven't delivered me yet. I know that my enemies are still around me, but I present my thank offerings to you because I know you listen to me. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling. That I may walk before God in the light of life. What does that mean? To walk before God in the light of life. It takes me straight back to Psalm 23 which says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Because I'm big and I'm tough and I've got muscles and I've got Goliath's sword. No, because you, God, are with me. Does your sword guard me? No, your your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, there's a change in David's attitude. There's a reminder of the things I know in my mind, the things that I have had God prove to me over and over again. But as human beings, we forget We forget just how big God is. We forget just how loving God is. Yes, God is loving when things are going good, you know, when he's blessing me and he's pouring these blessings out upon me. But when things get tough, it's just like God's forgotten me. You know, he's he's flimsy like that. He's a bit feeble, you know. He can can be a friend over here and then totally forget about you over here. But David comes back and says, no, your love is unchanging. It covers the whole earth. And no matter what situation in, as Gary said last week, he doesn't have to focus all his attention over here and worry about this situation, leaving this one unguarded. He is big enough to deal with every situation at all times. And so when David is delivered from Gath, when he's delivered from the king Abimelech, when he's delivered from the Philistines, 
At my first reading of Psalm 34, it looked like David was pretty well saying, I was pretty clever, wasn't I? God, you gave me the wisdom of being clever. I just had to act a bit stupid and they kicked me out. But when I read Psalm 56, I realise that it is because David has handed himself back over to God. It's not by my strength. It's not by my sword. It's not by my intellect that my enemies are defeated. It is by my God. It is by my God. And now, now what I want to do is go back and read Psalm 34 again in the light of Psalm 56. But I'm not going to do it today. That's next week. Let's pray. Father, we think so much more of ourselves than we should. We feel we have to protect ourselves. We feel that we can do things in our own strength. We feel there's things that we can do in our own intellect. We make this choice uh, to know good and evil in our own minds. Father, I pray that you would reveal to us the flaws in our behaviour, the darkness in our own hearts and minds that causes us to take our focus off you and to fear the world around us, to fear what other people think of us, to fear death, Father, bring our focus back to you. To the truths that we know are true. That you are sovereign. You are all-powerful. You are almighty. You are all-knowing. You are all-loving. You have no bounds. You don't get exhausted. You are eternal. Father, help us to repeat these words over to ourselves. To sing your praise. Father, to recall the times that you have been faithful. To reveal to us how many times you've been faithful and we don't even notice it. That, Father, we may fear you. And not the world around us. For what can mortal man do to me? Father, we want to be able to walk through this life with our heads held high. Not fearing what can happen around us. But trusting in you. That we might know life in its fullness. And desire to meet you face to face. Father, may you be the desire of our heart. And that may that be reflected in the way we live our lives. May we walk in the light of life. Thank you for listening to us. Even when we dribble on. When we try to do things our own way. Father, thank you for being faithful. And I pray this through the ultimate example of your faithfulness through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to come to the table right now. And...